Here we go. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Carving It Up Live right here on Facebook Live, YouTube, and Twitter. I am Bryson Carver, as always, and what a night last night. NFL Draft, first round, 2021. It felt somewhat normal again. You had a, a lot of fans there, right? You had the commissioner of the NFL, Roger Goodell, announcing the picks from the stage. You had fans on his couch from his basement. You had all kinds of draft surprises, which I'll obviously get into in just a second. Uh, you have Aaron Rodgers, once out of Green Bay. Talked about that yesterday. Uh, there's new reports on him today that I'll discuss. Also, uh, Mike Guido is going to join the show. He's an NFL draft expert. He'll join the show to discuss the latest with the NFL draft, not just from last night, but what to expect from rounds two through seven, rounds two through three, kickoff uh, in less than an hour at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific time on ESPN, ABC, and the NFL Network. So let's start with uh, with the first shocker of the draft, right? Everybody knew Trey Lawrence, Trevor Lawrence was going to Jacksonville. We, we knew that since the season concluded. Uh, everybody has known for about a month or so that Zach Wilson was going to the New York Jets. So there was no surprises there. We get to number three, okay? And I have said, swear to y'all, it feels like since the national championship concluded, Alabama destroys Ohio State. Mac Jones plays unbelievable. He was excellent. He was excellent all season long. 41 touchdowns, four interceptions. And I'm, I'm just, after that game, I, I know everybody was real high on Mac Jones. And I'm like, hold, hold on here. Hold on. This is your prototypical Alabama SEC quarterback going into the league, getting overhyped. We're talking about a guy who's immobile, average arm, uh, you know, under pressure is terrible. Look at the tape. They showed the tape last night on, ES, uh, last night on ESPN. Go look it up for yourself. It's, it's not great. And we had heard for a week, two weeks maybe, that the San Francisco 49ers, they were going to take Mac Jones. That was the reports coming out from multiple trusted sources. Ian Rappaport, Adam Schefter, everybody. And then we heard earlier this week, okay, they've narrowed it down to two guys because they know Trevor Lawrence is going to be off the board. They know Zach Wilson is going to be off the board. And now there's the three high-profile quarterbacks left. Trey Lance, Mac Jones, or Justin Fields. And Justin Fields was out in San Francisco, so it came down to Trey Lance, Mac Jones, and we had heard for a while it's going to be it's going to be Mac Jones. Kyle Shanahan likes Mac Jones. John Lynch likes Trey Lance. And last night I was actually on a on another show. My good buddy Ryan Flowers from uh, Clutch Sports Talk was on a live stream with him, uh, among other great guests. Uh, had a great time last night uh, breaking down the draft live. It was it was a it was a great time. But it gets to the three pick, and I'm thinking, yeah, they're going to take Mac Jones. They're they're. I, there's no way I would do it. There's no way. But they're going to take Mac Jones. And Roger Goodell says with the third pick in the 2021 NFL Draft, the San Francisco 49ers select Trey Lance. And I, I just fell back. I'm like, hold on. I, I can't believe this. And I was obviously happily shocked because I have great respect for John Lynch, the general manager, who's done an excellent job of putting this team together. They're, they've been a great drafting team, not just in the first round, but beyond the first round since he took over as the general manager of the 49ers. Kyle Shanahan, when he's had a healthy quarterback, the one season he did have a healthy quarterback, they went to the Super Bowl. And that healthy quarterback wasn't a superstar. It was Jimmy Garoppolo. And when you hear for the last couple of weeks, oh, it's, it's Mac. Mac Jones is the guaranteed. I'm thinking... What happened? Hold, hold on. You're Kyle Shanahan. You're one of the better offensive coaches we have in the NFL. Why do you want Mac Jones? And they take Trey Lance, and it turns out that John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan, they had a press conference um, about an hour or so after they made the pick, and Kyle Shanahan said, basically, once we traded up to get that third overall pick, they traded up all the way from number 12. They get the 12th overall pick. They trade all the way up to three. And Shanahan says, basically, once, once we did that, there's this media narrative, there's this, this story that the Niners are going to take the quarterback out of Alabama. And so he basically said, we just kind of toyed around with it. We, we, just, we, we let the media have their narrative. And it turns out the scouting to also Adam Schefter reported during the draft not long after the pick was made. 
He tweeted that the 49ers scouting department wanted them to take Mac Jones. But last night, okay, the general manager, John Lynch, the head coach, Kyle Shanahan, talked about it. And they said, you know what? We're going with Trey Lance. And they did not tell the scouting department. The scouting department did not know that Trey Lance was going to be the future of the 49ers until they heard it from the commissioner of the NFL himself. So they they pulled the rug out from under the scouting department. The head coach and the general manager did. So that's that's what they did. So give them credit where credit's due. But I, I, I just sit back and I, I say, good for San Francisco. Good for San Francisco. This is a well-run team, a great coaching staff. Again, the last time they were fully healthy, they didn't just make the Super Bowl. They dominated their way to the Super Bowl. Destroyed Minnesota. Destroyed Green Bay twice back in the regular season in the in, in the NFC Championship game. Wasn't even close. And if Jimmy Garoppolo makes, you know, people blame Kyle Shanahan for that loss to Kansas City in the Super Bowl when they gave up a 10-point uh, lead in the final five minutes or so. And my response is, Jimmy Garoppolo made, you know, was was put in the position to make the throw to Emmanuel Sanders, and he overshot him, and that was that. And so you get to last year, and it's just injury after injury. Garoppolo goes down, Kittle goes down, Boza goes down, Debo Samuel goes down, Richard Sherman goes down. I mean, it's one after another. This team was snake bitten last year, and finished a mediocre six and ten. Now, I think they need to keep Jimmy Garoppolo. I think they need to do, and I talked about it yesterday. Do what the Kansas City Chiefs did in 2010. You draft a quarterback you love. In Kansas City's case, it was Patrick Mahomes. In the 49ers' case, it's Trey Lance. Okay? You sit back and you play Alex Smith like the Chiefs did in 2017. You play Jimmy Garoppolo this year. Okay? Will he stay healthy? That's up for for debate. He has showed a... You know, the one thing consistent about Jimmy Garoppolo is it seems like every year he gets hurt. Going back to 2016... 2018, he tore his ACL, stayed healthy 2019. They got to the Super Bowl last year. He had ankle issues, shoulder issues. And so that was was it with Jimmy Garoppolo. And so you play him out. He's a good veteran guy. You know, as long as his team stays healthy, San Francisco's too talented to miss the playoffs. They missed the playoffs solely because of injuries last year. Let's not get that mixed up. So even in this tough division, even in this tough division with Arizona, who got better, with Seattle, who won the, the, the division last year and is seems to be keeping Russell Wilson at least for one more year, and the Los Angeles Rams, who upgraded a quarterback in Matthew Stafford. But even with all that, are you telling me the 49ers went healthy? Even with Jimmy G? Can't be one of the seven best teams in the NFC next year? They will be. They're going to make the playoffs. Uh, they're, they're, you know, who knows, will they win you know, multiple playoff games? That's That's up for debate. But you get Trey Lance. He sits behind Jimmy Garoppolo for a year. Okay, he learns from him. And the next year, you trade Jimmy G, you hand the franchise to Trey Lance, and he's going to do special things for you. He is. He's he's big. He can run. He ran for 1,100 yards his, his one year at North Dakota State. He doesn't turn the ball over. 26 touchdowns, zero picks in his only year at North Dakota State. He's a great kid. Uh, he's got leadership intangibles that you love and you want to have in a quarterback. He's mature. That's the, that's one of the maturity is one of the biggest things that the scouting departments and, and and everybody was talking about with Trey Lance is like, man, this kid is mature beyond his years. That's great. Okay, when you when you are giving your franchise to a young man, and Trey Lance is Trey Lance is ten days away from being twenty one years old, so he's a, he is he's a young man. When you are giving the keys to your franchise to somebody, you got to trust that hey. He's, he's going to be the adult in the room when, when things start to go south, and they will. Listen, for everybody, for Trevor Lawrence, it's going to go south. For all of these quarterbacks and all these players, it ain't going to be perfect all the way through. It's the NFL. It's life. When things start to go south, you got to have somebody to say, you know what, guys? Let's rein it back in and go win some football games. Trey Lance is that guy. Not saying Mac Jones isn't, but I haven't heard about Mac Jones' leadership qualities. And again, and I'll discuss Mac Jones a little later uh, once we have Mike Guido on. But the best quarterback in the league that is immobile is Tom Brady, without a doubt, right? Jared Goff's inconsistent. You know, Phillip Rivers last year was, you know, up and down. Drew Brees was clearly on his last leg. He looked every bit of 41 years old. And Big Ben Roethlisberger looked every bit of 38 years old. So those are the quarterbacks that, you know, big name quarterbacks that cannot move and get outside the pocket and make plays. Tom Brady. 
Greatest quarterback ever. Had an unbelievable season last year. 40 touchdowns and won, won the Super Bowl. Went through the gauntlet of Breeze, Rodgers, and Mahomes. Under duress. Under pressure. Statistically, Tom Brady's the 30th best quarterback in the NFL. Or at least he was last year. You know who's up there in the top five? Mahomes. Lamar Jackson. Aaron Rodgers. Russell Wilson. Okay, these guys can get outside the pocket and make plays. You look at these quarterbacks. Yeah, you know, something I haven't heard enough about with Trevor Lawrence. Maybe it's because we haven't we barely talked about Trevor Lawrence because he was the shoe in for, the, for to, to be the number one pick two years ago. Two years ago, we didn't know the number one pick would be in 2019. We didn't know the number one pick would be in 2020. We darn sure knew who was going to be the number one pick in 2021. And so maybe maybe this is why it's gone under the radar. Trevor Lawrence can move. Did you see the 61-yard touchdown he scampered for against the Ohio State Buckeyes two years ago, or a year ago, I should say, in the semifinal game? 61 yards and was flying too. Okay, Zach Wilson can get outside the pocket and make plays. I think he's a little reckless, but he can get outside the pocket and make plays. Okay, Justin Fields, we know he can run. Trey Lance just, just gave it to you, ran for 1,100 yards at North Dakota State in 2019. And of course, you know, didn't get to play last year because there wasn't a season. Only, only you know, got to play one game and, and then COVID, you know, did what COVID's done for a while. It, it, it got the season canceled, unfortunately. And so I say, good on the 49ers. Good on the 49ers. They, they made the pick. They're not going to win the Super Bowl this year. They're, they're, they're not. I, I, I highly doubt that. But if we're talking about a team that is set up for the future with the young players they've got, George Kittle's still fairly young. Debo Samuel's going into his third year. Nick Bowles is going into his third year. Okay, the, the defensive line is still young. You got a guy I love out of, from my Tennessee Volunteers, Emmanuel Mosley, one of the better slot corners in the league. Okay, the, and, and, and Kyle Shanahan, one of the best offensive coaches you'll see in the National Football League. This team is set up to do great things in the future, even in the NFC West, even in the toughest division in football. I say they have the brightest future, the 49ers do. Because the Cardinals... Well, can they give you know Kyler Murray a running game? That's one thing San Francisco does better than most is they run the football. That's Kyle Shanahan. Everywhere he goes, they run the football well. Seattle, is Russell Wilson truly happy there? Are we sure he's going to be there in the long term? And then the Rams. Rams are the only team that I say, okay. But again, Matthew Stafford is getting you know close to his mid-30s. He's not, he's, he's not the young stud he used to be. He can still play, but he's not what he used to be. And so uh, all that into consideration, the 49ers, Absolutely made the right pick, uh, drafting Trey Lance with the third overall pick. I was shocked, but then again, uh, Mac Jones slid all the way to 15 in New England. That's all I got to say. So uh, with that, I'm going to bring uh, Mike Guido on the show. He is the um, the host of Guido's Grit Gridiron Blitz on LandryFootball.com and a frequent guest on my good buddy uh, Barry Grant Jr.'s show, The All Even Podcast. Would you please welcome Mike Guido? to Carving It Up Live. Mike, how you doing, man? I'm good, brother. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to have you on the show. So, real quick, I see you got your, is that Ezekiel Elliott jersey? It is. It I is. See. He's disappointed me the past couple of years, but yes. I'm right there with you, man. That's I, I, Since he sounded ideal, he hasn't been the same player, but that's another story for another day. Uh, before we get into the draft, though, I would like to get into the Aaron Rodgers story that broke yesterday. Yep. Uh, clearly, this has been boiling over for a while. I feel like the beginning of the end, the straw that broke the camel's back, as we all know, they took Jordan Love a year ago when they could have used a, a skill position player on the outside to team up with Devontae Adams. What is your reaction to the whole situation, and, and what's your kind of your takeaway with this Aaron Rodgers situation? Well, I think it's hard to blame Aaron Rodgers for being uh, disgruntled because it's been like this for years, right? This is not something – because it, the reports are all saying, oh, this is all stemming from a contract negotiation. I don't believe that. OK, this is coming from a year or two or maybe even a half decades worth of it, Listen, it, you've flat out refused to help me out offensively. You just have, you know, you shouldn't have to bank on your fifth or sixth round pick to turn into something that can be productive. So I date it back to last year, right? Last year in the draft. And we, you and I both know this, Bryson. I mean, last year's draft, 45 or 50 wide receivers were going to get drafted. It was it's such a loaded class. Green yep. Bay didn't draft one. It's unbelievable how they just refi they they used the assets to to draft defense. They drafted about 15 offensive linemen last year in the fifth and sixth round. Like they just refused to get him perimeter playmakers. You know, even this year. 
draft Elijah Moore, draft mm-hmm. Terrace Marshall, draft Rondale Moore, draft one of these guys that can make a legitimate difference in this offense. Trade up, get Kadarius Tony or something like that. Get Rashad Bateman. Do something to please your quarterback and make it look like you're trying to give him something. So it, it is really hard to to blame Aaron Rodgers. I also think part of this is I think Aaron Rodgers is semi losing the passion for football. And I don't know if that's because of Green Bay necessarily, but listen, he just hosted Jeopardy. Yep. His interests might have just changed. So you never know. But I think it's really tough right now to put any blame on Aaron Rodgers. Totally agree with you. You know, I, I talked about this yesterday, a few hours after it broke. And and my thing was, you know, the Packers are an organization that historically is not aggressive. They, they don't go after big name free agents. They don't make big trades. But in the Aaron Rodgers era, which dates back to 2008, when he became the starter there, the one time they were aggressive, they went and got Charles Woodson a year later. Aaron's got to be saying, man, the one year out of top 10 defense, the one time the organization was aggressive, we took on the home. We took the Lombardi Trophy home, and that's. Right. I, I don't blame him at all for being uh, for being ticked off with the situation. Yeah. Also, I think he looks. He he looked on the opposite sideline in the NFC Championship game and saw a veteran quarterback who left an organization that wouldn't put the adequate talent around him. Right, and that worked out pretty well for him. Yeah. So um, I think he's got that. That's got to be running in the back of his head or in the front of his head in this situation. So that's that's really interesting. Okay. So led my show off with, obviously, the third overall pick. It was the first big shock, I think, of the draft. Trey Lance over Mac Jones. What's your reaction to it, and do you think the 49ers made the right selection? Well, I'm first of all, I was surprised by it because I genuinely thought they were going to go Mac Jones. It seemed that Kyle Shanahan was so enamored by how smart Mac Jones was, the fact that he had pretty much memorized their playbook after their pro day. Like It was just amazing how enamored they were with Mac Jones. However, I do think that Trey Lance was the right pick. Here's why. Kyle Shanahan's offense is very spread out. There's a lot of moving parts. It requires a lot of quarterback movement and playing off script. It it requires a lot of those things. Mac Jones isn't that. Mac Jones, that's the one knock he has. He's deadly accurate from the pocket, but if you ask him to go off script, he kind of falls a little bit flat. So bringing Trey Lance in, he's a little bit more of a project but I think he can accomplish more of what they want. But it also tells you something about San Francisco's future, right? And how they view their future. If they had drafted Mac Jones, I think you would have seen, okay, Jimmy Garoppolo's out the door. Mac Jones ready to play right now, right? Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be around for a year or even two because Trey Lance is such a young, raw prospect that hasn't played against top tier t- uh, competition too much. And again, granted, he dominated at North Dakota State against that uh, weaker competition per se, but it, it is going to take time for him to develop into that. It, Trey Lance was QB two for me behind Trevor Lawrence, but I agree. I thought they did end up making the right selection. And to be honest with you, it really shook up the draft because I think that changed. I think if Atlanta, uh, I, I'm sorry, I think if San Francisco had taken Mac Jones, I think Atlanta would have taken Trey Lance because I think that was the guy that they were interested in. But, because of that, Kyle Pitts goes to Atlanta and they completely opt out of quarterback together. So it was a lot of things that shook up last night from San Francisco taking Trey Lance. But yes, it was the right pick for me. I totally agree with you. And, and that's something somebody else that I thought was going to trade into the top 10 and it surprised me that they didn't was the Washington football team. Is because you've got Ryan Fitzpatrick, good veteran player, but coming off a division title when you use four quarterbacks, you got to be thinking if you're Ron Rivera, man, we're we're a young quarterback, you know, maybe two or three years down the road away from really being a contender considering the the defense. And they've got solid weapons on the outside with uh, Terry McLaurin and Logan Thomas at tight end. So, uh, no, but I agree with you. I think Trey Lance is is not ready to play yet, but um, right there with you, I think he's the second best quarterback behind, obviously, Trevor Lawrence. Now, uh, Mac Jones in New England, how do you think he fits in that system considering they him and Cam Newton couldn't be, too, couldn't be more different as far as their style of play at quarterback? Yeah, yeah but... Cam Newton was terrible in New England last year, and I don't think that they're going to try and recreate Cam Newton. Um, I actually don't even think they're really trying to recreate Tom Brady, but I think they're 
drafting Mac Jones means that they can be more comfortable running a system that they're familiar with, right? Mac Jones is a dissector of defenses. That's what he does. He's crazy accurate. He's a surgeon. He does. It, it, he picks apart defenses. That's what he did at Alabama. And he's an incredibly coachable kid. He's incredibly smart. And I think he has a lot of the factors that Tom Brady had, at least mentally. And I loved it when people compared Mac Jones to Tom Brady because you're only really comparing him to Tom Brady to justify him being a first round pick and not being athletic. So <laughs> I thought that was uh, something in itself. But Mac Jones is potentially a great fit in New England. It depends on how he takes the coaching. I think it also depends on how long Josh McDaniels is there. I also think that it depends on the things that they build around him. We all know that New England can't put perimeter players. Or they're, they ter they're terrible at drafting perimeter skill position players. So I think a lot of factors go into it. But on the surface right now, it looks like Mac Jones would be a pretty good fit in New England right now. Maybe he is, but I, I think, and I talked about it earlier in the show, and I've talked about it for you know the, the few months leading to the draft. In today's NFL, you've got to be able to extend plays. You've got to be able to get outside the pocket. We see Trevor Lawrence can do that. Zach Wilson can do that. Uh, Justin Fields, to an extent, can do that. And obviously, Trey Lance can do that. I didn't see that out of out of Mac Jones last year at Bama. Right. Yeah. No, I, I don't think you're wrong, but I think it's different when – you, it require offenses require you to move around in the pocket and you know get get out of it and play off script and everything like that. But that's usually because the ball isn't getting out quick enough, right? Mac Jones, his specialty at Alabama is that ball's getting out in a second and a half, two seconds, right? So again, and part of that was because he's got Jalen Wall and uh, uh, and Devontae Smith playing wide yes. receiver, and he doesn't have that in New England, so. Again, we're going to see how all of that goes, but if the ball gets out quickly, which is normally what the New England offense requires, right? Tom Brady never held the ball for too long. It was the snap, one step, ball out, right? If yeah. they can recreate that with Mac Jones, I think it'll work. Okay, we'll see what happens. Uh, now, the biggest mistake in the draft, at least in the top 10, I think it went under the radar. And listen, I, I like Jamar Chase a lot. I think the Bengals made a massive mistake okay. not taking Panay Sewell because... I, and I talked about this last year. This is why I don't think in the long run that Joe Burrow will be successful. He reminds me a little bit of David Carr, right? Yeah. Crazy talented coming out of college, but he's going to a team that can't protect him to save his life, and it cost him the rest of his season last year with that uh, you know, torn up knee. So what was your reaction? I, I really did think they were going to take Panay Sewell, and I get the LSU connection, but what was, what was your re reaction to that pick? Well, my mock draft had Jamar Chase going to the Bengals, and, okay. and here's the thing. I, for about a year, I agreed with you because I, I was just saying, look, you got to protect your shiny new toy, right? Joe Burrow's the face of the franchise. He's the hometown kid. You got to protect him. Number one pick, everything like that. And he looked pretty good last year. And the Bengals asked him to do a lot. I mean, he was throwing the ball 40, 50 times a game. It was unbelievable what he was able to do based on how much he was asked to do. Um, but here's the thing. And I think the reason I shifted on this is because I actually don't think that the Bengals offensive line is in as bad shape as I think most people are making it out to be. Okay. Jonah Williams is a really solid left tackle and he's he getting better every year. They gave Riley reef $7 million to play right tackle. He was playing left tackle for the Vikings and he wasn't great, but you would expect at least a little bit of improvement at right tackle for Riley reef, right? He's been in the league for a long time. So, in that sense, the primary need for them, I think, was on the interior, not necessarily the exterior. If they were going to draft Penny Sewell, I think you got to move Jonah Williams inside or something like that and put him at left tackle. But I I'm not sure they really wanted to do that. They looked at Jamar Chase and they said, OK, uh, he caught 20 touchdowns <laughs> with Joe Burrow at LA. Standing. So, you know. If the ball's going to get out quick, right? And I said this before about Mac Jones. If the ball is going to get out quick and you've got Jamar Chase, you've got Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, you got Joe Mixon in the backfield, I think you can provide him enough weapons. And again, this is a deep offensive line class that doesn't get a lot of credit. You can still yes. land somebody like Landon Dickerson or Creed Humphrey or Wyatt Davis on the inside. And even if you wanted to go tackle and you wanted to move guys around, you still got guys like Samuel Cosme and Tevin Jenkins available in the second round. I mean, you're going to have a lot of guys that are available to you. 
So I don't think that the Bengals are really skimping out on offensive line. I think they just saw the opportunity to grab Jamar Chase. They see, okay, that relationship is going to be really electric, and they just felt they needed to take advantage of it. So I don't think it was necessarily a mistake. It's a bold move, but I don't necessarily think it was a mistake. Yeah, and I get that. I I also, someone else he reminds me of, and I don't think he's as talented as this guy, but a guy who's out of the league now, unfortunately, Andrew Luck. The Colts, year in and year out, they added more and more weapons. T.Y. Hilton, Reggie Wayne That's came on right. towards the end. Shiny new toys for their their franchise quarterback, but the offensive line was hot garbage on the 4th of July, yeah. and and that cost him you know, his career. Yeah, and we'll so I, see what they do today and yes. see if they can, they can improve in some sort of sense just to get more guys that can protect him. Because, again, if they go and say, okay, we're going to take a corner in the second round, I'm going to be like, okay, then you shouldn't have taken Jamar Chase. It's right. a lot of it is dependent on what they do in these next couple of rounds to really solidify that offensive line so they can make sure that Joe Burrow's healthy for next year. Yeah, I see, I see what you're saying there. So uh, now the two great – to me, the two best defensive players in the draft actually went, uh, you know, in, in from pick nine to pick 12. Pat Sertan to the Denver Broncos, which as a uh, fellow Dallas Cowboys fan broke my heart. Uh, but – My heart, yeah. If, if, if it wasn't going to be Sertan, I'm – I'm thrilled to take Micah Parsons when you see what he did at Penn State. What was your reaction, and how do you think both guys fit into the systems in Denver and Dallas, respectively? So I'll start with Dallas first because I think that move was a little bit more interesting because it involved the trade. Um, And honestly, Dallas, when they were sitting at the 10th pick, I think that was a sporadic, well, screw it, we're trading out. I think there was that sort of mentality going through it because all the guys they wanted were gone. J.C. Horn was gone. Sertan was gone. Sewell was gone. Kyle Pitts was gone. Everybody that they wanted was off the board. So they were saying, okay, we need time to gather our thoughts. What are we going to do? So I actually think, and I've come around to it because at the beginning of it, I was just like, eh, I don't love it. I don't hate it. But the reality is, and what's the goal of the draft, Bryson? It's, it's, It's usually just to get really good football players, right? Mm-hmm. Mike Parsons is a really good football player. He is. He's going to he's going to pound for pound more than likely he was the best defensive player in the whole draft, right? Just so explosive. The guy runs a 43640 and he's 250 pounds. Like it's just the guy's Ridiculous. unbelievable as a freakish athlete. Mike Parsons could legitimately change that defense. And the reason I'm saying that is because most people when they look at the draft, they look at so heavily the positional need. I think that people need to get past that. People need to move forward from the positional need because the positional need for Dallas and Micah Parsons is a little awkward because you have Leighton Van Der Esch and Jalen Smith at linebacker, and they're both pretty good. So it makes sense to Leighton Van Der Esch if he gets hurt. Okay, you have Micah Parsons there to take the spot. I think it's more than that. Dan Quinn's running this defense now. Micah Parsons is going to find a spot on the field and make an impact whether it's as an edge rusher, whether it's at a guy who just roams at the second level, whether it, he's whether he commands blitz, uh, blitz packages or anything like that, Micah Parsons' bottom line is going to make the Dallas defense better. That's the first thing. As for Patrick Sertan, it, it's less to do about what I think he's going to be, right? Because I genuinely think Patrick Sertan has the potential to be a number one corner. I'm shocked that Denver didn't go quarterback. And that's really the I agree with my you. criticism for them is that, okay, you took a corner and he's going to be good for a long time. But first of all, they already have a really good corner group. Kyle Fuller, Ronald Darby, Ojemudia, Bryce Callahan. Those are good corners. And I know you got some guys on one-year deals, but those are good corners that you can easily bring back and solidify that group. You add Sertan, and now it's an elite group. But you're still working with Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater at quarterback, and I'm not sure that that's going to get you anywhere, especially when you're in a division with Justin Herbert, Pat Mahomes, yeah. and Eric Carr. So it's it's a lot to ask for. So for Dallas, I love the trade back and the, and the pick of Parsons because it definitely makes their defense better. In fact, I actually think that when it's all said and done, they might uh, the Cowboys might have been better off taking Micah Parsons than one of the corners because I think Micah Parsons can impact that defense in more ways than a corner can. Right. And on the part of Dallas, I think, you know, a lot of Cowboys fans, they want a Kyle Pitts and look, I I get it. It, it, He would make the offense unguardable. I mean, you you got just weapons all over the place. Yeah. (laughs) But my thing was, yeah, but that, you know, great offense can't, can't score 50 points a game. I mean, the, the defense was 
Yeah. Just abysmal. It was terrible. And, and, that, and I get it. That was a, a different defensive coordinator who had no business being there. But it came down to me to Sertan and, and Micah Parsons. And if you had to get Micah Parsons in this way to get an extra third round pick, I think that does work out well for Dallas because look, they didn't need Devontae Smith. I, I think it I think that trade works for both Philly and Dallas, possibly more so with Dallas in, in the end. Purposely um, screwed over the Giants, Bryson. They did. Purposely they did. screwed over the Giants. What a brilliant mind game that Jerry Jones played against the Giants. Give him credit. Give him credit. He and, and Micah Parsons almost reminds me a little bit of a guy who I loved last year, Isaiah Simmons out of Clemson. Uh, yes. Kind of positionless, and, and, and can you, you can put him anywhere. And and like you said, it, uh, with the defensive scheme of Dan Quinn, I think he'll he'll be a, a, an instant impact player and, and a great player for for Dallas for years to come. Yeah, Micah Parsons is almost like the opposite of Isaiah, Sim- and I don't mean that as in like they're they're opposite players, but they come from opposite backgrounds. Meaning their futures at the linebacker position. I'm going to put quotes around that because they're going to be just. I think they're guys that are going to play all over. But Isaiah Simmons. They're very similar athletically. Isaiah Simmons came from a defensive back background. He played safety, and he even played nickel corner at some point. Micah Parsons was an edge rusher. So right. they've both kind of moved around and said, hey, listen, your best spot is going to be as a super athletic guy at the second level of the defense that's going to, that's going to go get the quarterback. And honestly, I think that could work out incredibly well for both of them. Quickly, um, Zach Wilson in New York. Yeah, they have improved the offensive line, which is huge. Um, I don't know. I don't think he's gonna be a bust. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> he and I, I did see Zach Wilson play a game a couple of years ago against Tennessee, and his his release is is probably better than anybody in the draft. I mean, he's just quick. It reminds me a little bit of Aaron Rodgers in a way yeah, how quick the ball so. comes out. Um, but he, you know, it's the old saying: if you throw a lot of interceptions in college, you're gonna throw a lot in the NFL. Jameis Winston, Sam Darnold. Do you think Zach Wilson is what the Jets have been looking for since Joe Namath? God, I, I, you know, I don't know because I think that is very dependent on how well the Jets build around him. And again, it's a very cop out, boring answer. But the reality is, is that if Joe Douglas and I believe Joe Douglas is going to do a good job. So if 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 I think if that translates to my answer, then I'll say yes. I think Zach Wilson's going to succeed in New York because. First of all, I don't think he has a very small head. I think he's going to be able to grow into it. I think people are going to like him. Um, he's obviously a likable kid. The guy looks like an actor. Like he's just, he's a New York looking type of guy, right? Sure. And I think he's going to mature in that city well. Um, the talent is off the charts, you know. So as long as he's coached well, and Robert Sala is going to bring in an offensive coordinator that runs a very Kyle Shanahan ish offense right because that's just the system that he's familiar with right if the coaching is good and the jets continue to build around him again they got a good start yesterday but when they traded up to get elijah vera tucker Bingo. that was a great trade dude totally agree I mean, with you three two third round picks and they get a fourth back and don't be surprised if they trade back in the second round from 34 and recoup those picks back so don't be surprised if they do something like that, but they're already in the process of saying, okay, we got to make sure this guy's protected. We got to make sure this guy has targets to throw to. We got to make sure this guy has a running game that's reliable. If they're already in the process of doing that, then at the very least, Zach Wilson won't have any excuses on why to fail. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So if, if Zach Wilson wants to succeed in New York and he prepares and everything's going to be there around him and he's there mentally, then there's no reason why he shouldn't succeed in New York. I think he has been put in a much better position than Sam Darnold was put in a few years back. You know, you look at coaching, you look at offensive line, uh, you know, skill position players. Yeah. Uh, defensively, again, we know what Robert Sala did in San Francisco, so uh, you you would think that they would improve on that side of the football. Yeah. Now, final question tonight: rounds two to three of the NFL draft kicks off in about thirty minutes or so. Um, who are the key guys for you, and what do you anticipate happening uh, starting in, in in half an hour? Well, I, you know, I, I think that they're going to go pretty early, but I am very, very curious on what's going to happen with Jeremiah wusu out of Notre Dame. Yes. Okay. There there were people that had him as a top 15 player overall, and there it's not even like we had – it was my it was Micah Parsons, and then there was nobody left. Jamin Davis got taken over him. You know, Peyton Turner got taken over him. Like it really makes you wonder, you know, guys like Jason Owe and Joe Tryon were taken over him. So it's very interesting to see where he ends up tonight. 
I'm also very curious on on people like Trayvon Morig or or guys like uh, Tevin Jenkins. You know, some of these top guys. I will say this though, I, I it's not necessarily a diamond in the rough because I, I think he's a better player than I think most people expect him to be. But whoever drafts Pat Fryermuth out of Penn State, the tight mm, end, he's good, is going to get a gem. That guy can block. He's a great receiver. He's a tough kid. I think whoever gets Pratt Fryermuth tonight, maybe it's us. Maybe the next Jason Witten. Hey, they're going to be getting something really, really good. Boy, forgetting the next Jason Witten, man. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> Mike Guido from Guido's Gridiron Blitz joining the show. Hope to have you on sometime again in the future, man. Thank you for coming on. Of course, we'll talk to you. That was Mike Guido from Guido's Gridiron Blitz on Landry dot com. Uh, let me did I say that right? LandryFootball.com. I apologize. So, um, yeah, I think we're in for an outstanding NFL draft um, in the next six rounds. Listen, first round gets all the publicity, as it should. But, listen, the, like like he mentioned, diamond in the roughs, they're found, you know, in spurts in rounds two through three because we know these guys can play. But especially four through seven tomorrow, listen, some of the best players of all time have been drafted late rounds. Some of the best players ever went undrafted. So you just got to go pick by pick by pick. Uh, and it, it, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So uh, let me transition now to uh, to Aaron Rodgers. Now, of course, we, we discussed Aaron Rodgers a little bit. Um, Aaron Rodgers, according to, we, we got two big stories from arguably the two best insiders uh, with the NFL in, in, in Ian Rappaport from the NFL Network and in Adam Schefter from ESPN. Now, first of all, um, according to Adam Schefter, he has told his Packers teammates that he does not plan on returning. Now, that is significant because it's different from Deshaun Watson and Russell Wilson. Again, we don't know if they told their teammates that they're done. But we never got a report, hey, Deshaun told his Texans teammates he's out of Houston. Russell Wilson told his teammates in Seattle he's out. And by the way, I think Russell's situation was a whole lot different than Aaron Rodgers in that more than anything, I think he wanted more say in the organization. Whereas Rodgers, it's give me some help. Give me some help. I'm one of the best quarterbacks of all time. And... They haven't. They 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 absolutely refuse to. It seems like they won't pay for anybody. But by the way, it seems like every now and then the organization seems to complain about his contract, which he's getting paid less than Dak, who he's better than. Uh, he's getting paid less than uh, Russ. Some can make, some would make the argument he's better than Russ, uh, more than Deshaun Watson. I think he's slightly better than Deshaun. So it's like this is one of the greatest quarterbacks ever. This is arguably the greatest thrower of the football of all time. And y'all are complaining about his contract when you won't pay anybody else. Uh, tell me where that makes sense. But and, and then another report, and I, and this this one's really really interesting to me. And stick with me. This is why. So according to Ian Rappaport, retiring is a ser a quote serious consideration for Aaron Rodgers. Now retiring from the NFL, and, and Guido talked about too. With you know, maybe Aaron Rodgers is not. I see this. This this sounds weird, but not into football as as much as he was in the past. Again, I don't know if that's the case or not. But something that is significant. Who who has the same agent has had? Don't know if it's past or present tense. The same agent as Aaron Rodgers, guy by the name of Carson Palmer. Remember him. Play with the Cincinnati Bengals, number one overall pick years back. And eventually Carson Palmer gets frustrated with the Bengals organization. He wants out. They refuse. And so what does Carson Palmer, Palmer do? He retires and comes back not long later with the Oakland Raiders and then goes to the Arizona Cardinals and has success in the no-risk-it-no-biscuit Bruce Arians-style offense. So I think that's in the consideration. But also, if he actually is serious about retirement, this whole Jeopardy thing was like, oh, like he actually retired to go to Jeopardy. Now, something that's that's really interesting as well, the only two MVPs, uh, I can't remember the name of the first guy. I know the second guy was uh, was Jim Brown. You know, some argue the greatest running back of all time back in the 60s. Only two MVPs have won the award and not come uh, have not returned to their team the very next season, and both guys retired. So is Aaron Rodgers going to join that group in permanent retirement from the NFL? I don't know. Is Aaron Rodgers' frustration with the Packers 
or is it with the Packers and it's stolen his joy of the game away? Man, I, I hope that's not the case. Uh, you, you don't want you know anybody's uh, love for the game to be stripped from them. And I, I don't again, I don't know if that's the case in Green Bay, but I, I, all I'm doing is speculating, just like just like the rest of y'all are. I mean, we're we're all in the same boat. We're we're just trying to figure out is he actually serious about possibly hanging up his cleats. And so, what I think is 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 particularly interesting is that you have a guy who's you know been, been obviously been the face of the franchise since 2008, and he's like, okay. I sat back and watched the Texans with Deshaun Watson. Obviously, Deshaun has more problems than the Houston Texans right now. Um, but he he sat back and saw, okay, the Texans, even before all the stuff with Deshaun came out, refused to trade him. The Seattle Seahawks, according to multiple reports, I think Peter Schrager said yesterday morning on Good Morning Football, he said the Seahawks did ne- never talk to anybody about trading for Russell Wilson. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But the Seahawks obviously... <laughs> Would prefer not to trade Russell Wilson. He's the best player in their franchise history, and he's still in his prime. I think they would prefer not to trade him. And Aaron Rodgers sat back and said, okay, I know the Packers are not going to trade me. They're they're not. So let me go with the route that my agent's client did, plays the same position as me, or played the same position as me, Carson Palmer, and say, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to sign my retirement papers. Maybe take a year off. Maybe maybe see how this full-time Jeopardy thing works. Obviously, he's getting married to Shailene Woodley soon. Congrats to the two of them. And just see how this retirement life is like. And then, and then say, you know what? Just take a look at the NFL. I, I remember when LeBron James, in 2018, many argued LeBron should have been the MVP back in 2018. And he had one of the great playoff runs that we've ever seen by uh, by a player in the NBA playoffs. He was outstanding. He, he put a garbage Cleveland team on his back and took him to the finals. Took him to the finals. And, of course, he was a free agent that year, and so we all knew he's not going back to Cleveland. After having to do that, playing all 82 games, obviously playing every playoff game and and just dragging the team night in and night out against the best in the Eastern Conference and then eventually against the fully loaded Golden State Warriors with Kevin Durant, we all knew LeBron wasn't going back to Cleveland. But, there had been some speculation, maybe LeBron, because there was the, yeah, the free agent class a year later in 2019 coming up with Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, Kawhi Leonard, Clay Thompson, Kimball Walker. He sat back. He, you know, it was a possibility he he could have sat back and said, you know what, my body's worn out. And we saw that first year in LA. Again, this is before Anthony Davis got there. LeBron was absolutely spent. Eight straight years going to the finals. The eighth was by far the most difficult for him. And he's just like, man, I need a break. And, of course, he he suffered the groin injury, I believe, because of the, re- the wear and tear of the last eight years of going to the finals, playing over 100 games every year. And, he, of course, he, 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 he hurt his groin against Golden State on Christmas. Didn't come back, I believe, for another month. And so... Hindsight's 2020, maybe he should have taken a year off, but of course he came back a year later, won the finals. But there was speculation. Maybe LeBron sits back and looks over the whole NBA, see, you know, gets his body right, gets his mind right, spends time with his family, and then goes somewhere that is ready to win now. And so with Aaron Rodgers, does he consider doing what it was thought to be Le- that LeBron could do a few years back? Take a year off. Enjoy time with your new wife. Enjoy the Jeopardy job. Okay? He's got other off-field endeavors. Enjoy going on the Pat McAfee show every Tuesday, as he as he did last season, when he was obviously a Green Bay Packer quarterback. See, see how that... Take like a trial run of retirement. And if you like it, great. If you don't, you can look at the NFL, just like Tom Brady did, and you get to decide where you go. You get to decide. Look at the whole NFL. Who's ready to win now? What did Tom Brady do? Now, Tom Brady obviously didn't retire to force his way out of New England, but he was a free agent, of course. And I, I know there have been those you know, all-time great players. Heck, the second greatest quarterback ever, Joe Montana, said there's no way he's leaving New England. Not after 20 years. And I said repeatedly a year ago on the show, he's leaving New England. At this point, he's he's... 
he had been frustrated with Belichick for years, but now it's gotten to the point where you I'm frustrated with Belichick and you won't get me weapons. And by the way, the, not long before he left New England, the Bills traded for Stephon Diggs. And he's like, man, y'all, y'all can't even go get me Steph, Stephon Diggs. Awfully similar to the Packers, okay? J.J. Watt was on the market. J.J. Watt wanted to go to Green Bay. Hometown kid, he's from Wisconsin. Bring him home and let's go win a Super Bowl. Put a ring on his finger. No, we don't want, we don't want to pay him $15 million. Okay, I'll go to Arizona and, and, and get my money, which he did. And I believe that could have possibly been the last straw is that Green Bay's, one of Green Bay's best offensive linemen, a center, was a free agent. He was a pro bowler. And they let him go. Aaron Jones, we thought was going to get paid, like a lot. And obviously he, he, got, he, he, he got his money, but not as much as he could have gotten. And J.J. Watt, Green Bay just lets him go, just like they let Khalil Mack. We all thought the Raiders, Packers, they're gonna they're gonna get a deal done for Khalil Mack. Uh, no, no, Khalil Mack gets traded to your division rival, the Chicago Bears, and immediately wins defensive player of the year. And so again, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, very similar situations. Tom looks at Tampa Bay, he's like, okay. Patriot agency, if I come, me being Tom Brady, the greatest quarterback ever. I know I can still play. We can attract their guy. Leonard Fournette, come on. Gronk, my man. Let's go, to, let's go to Tampa Bay and win another Super Bowl together. That worked out pretty well for, for Mr. Brady, didn't it? So I think that's what Aaron Rodgers is looking at. I think there's a culmination of a lot of things. It started, of course, with the Jordan Love pick a year ago in the first round. And I and listen, on this show, listen, I got to be transparent with y'all. I defended it. I was okay with the Jordan Love selection if they were going to address their, obviously outside of Devontae Adams, their lack of depth at the wide receiver position, and they didn't take a receiver the rest of the draft. Matter of fact, they took a running back in the second round, A.J. Dillon, who's good, you know, possibly has a a bright future in Green Bay, but he's going to be the backup behind Aaron Jones. So you have that, you have the J.J. Watt, they just let him go. The only reason Aaron Jones came back to Green Bay is because Green Bay got him on a discount. They let their number one center go. Uh, I believe Corey Lindsley was his name. Let him go, okay? A few years ago back, they, they, they let Khalil Mack go to Chicago in a trade when they could have easily traded for him. I mean, what? who are you going to draft that's better than Khalil Mack? You just had to trade a couple first-round picks, and I think a third-rounder Chicago included, to get Khalil Mack, and they didn't do it. They play it safe. That's that's the that's Green Bay's brand. They play it safe. And so Rodgers is like, you know what? I'm one of the 10 greatest quarterbacks ever. I I mean, I personally, Bryson Carver, I believe he's one of the 10 greatest quarterbacks ever. And I, Aaron probably believes he's the best quarterback ever. I, hey, I, I want him to believe that because that, that's going to that's gonna drive him and motivate him to be great, just like any athlete. But he's sitting there thinking, man, I'm, I'm the greatest throw of the football ever. And I'm stuck here in Green Bay where they won't get me any help. And then I look at Pat Mahomes in Kansas City and all the help that they put around him. And and, and, and a guy like Tom Brady, they put all the help around him in Tampa Bay, and they met in the Super Bowl. Okay, I look at a guy who I have deep respect for. Aaron Rodgers has said this. He has great respect for Matthew Stafford. He goes to the Rams. They've got all kinds of talent around him. Okay, uh, And he sits back and says, you know what? Heck, even in the division, look at the Minnesota, Minnesota Vikings. Stephon Diggs gets traded. What do they do? They draft Justin Jefferson, who had 1,400 receiving yards, the most ever by a rookie wide receiver. Green Bay does not take chances. And as the old saying goes, fortune favors the bold. And Green Bay is not bold. And it's cost them for the past decade. So, again, I don't blame Aaron Rodgers in the slightest for leaving. Matter of fact, I say good for Aaron Rodgers. But um, that, that's that's what I got to say there. Now, quickly, before we go, um, obviously, again, the NFL draft rounds two through three kicks off in about 10 minutes. So, uh, hey, hop off the show. Uh, of course, after we're done, we got one more topic. But hop off the show, and uh, and we'll, we'll all sit down and enjoy the, the rest of the NFL draft tonight and tomorrow rounds four through seven. going to be a, like a day-long thing, like six, seven hours. Uh, just, just NFL draft. It's going to be fun. Uh, but tonight... Uh, the Los Angeles Lakers, a team that has been sputtering 
I mean, they have not looked good. They've lost four of their last five since Anthony Davis came back. It, it has looked ugly. But help is on the way, as Shannon Sharp once said back in the 90s when the Broncos were, quote, to quote Mr. Sharp, killing the Patriots. Uh, help is on the way. LeBron James is back. He is back tonight. Uh, it, it's, according to the reports, as long as warmups go well, LeBron James will be back tonight for the Lakers at home tonight on NBA TV, by the way, so you can watch the game. Uh, uh, well, you, you can watch on League Pass, but it, it costs you money. You might as well watch, watch on NBA TV. Point is, they played the Sacramento Kings tonight. Nine games left in the year. LeBron James is back from his ankle injury that he suffered on March 20th. And I've said repeatedly on the show, like, if LeBron, and I think my gut tells me now, because with the Nets dealing with with guys sitting out and guys getting hurt, it's like and they can't build any team chemistry. But, you know, my, my, my gut tells me the Lakers are going to win the championship. But if LeBron James with this Lakers team, they have Anthony Davis, and they've looked awful for the last five games. It took a comeback to beat the Orlando Magic, who is the worst team offensively in basketball. It took a comeback to beat them. That's that's the Lakers in four of the last five games. And so, when I look at this, I say, okay, if LeBron James, and I'll repeat what I've said before. I say what I mean, I mean what I say. If LeBron James leads the Los, this Los Angeles Lakers team to the finals, especially if they get past the Clippers, and you know I think the Clippers will find a way to screw it up at some point in the playoffs, whether against the Lakers or somebody else. It ain't how it ain't if they'll lose; it's how they'll choke. That's what I've, that's been my motto for the Clippers this year after their three-one choke last year against Denver. Point is, if if the Lakers get to the finals and they meet up with Kevin Durant, James Harden, Kyrie Irving, and that deep Brooklyn Nets team, and LeBron James beats them, he's the greatest player of all time. I don't care what anybody says. With all due respect to the great Michael Jordan, did Jordan ever have to be anybody as tough as this Brooklyn team? Or that 73 and 9 Warriors team? Still breaks my heart. Or that 2013 Spurs team that to that point had never lost the finals under the leadership of Greg Popovich, under the veteran leadership of Tim Duncan, Mono Ginobili, Tony Parker, and LeBron in that series was outstanding. Three of his four championships, I should say two of his, yeah, three of his four championships have come against the Thunder with KD, Westbrook, and Harden, the 73-9 and nine Warriors, and the Spurs with Duncan, Parker, and Ginobili. Who did Jordan have to play that were tougher than those teams? Don't give me the Jazz. Stockton and Malone were great. That's all they had. That's all they had. And Jordan was outstanding in that series. And that Jazz, props to them. They weren't as good as some of these teams. Skill-wise, are you kidding me? Who on, the, who on that Jazz team was better than Kevin Durant? Okay, who on that Jazz team was better than Steph Curry? Or even Tim Duncan? All three of the best players on those three teams LeBron has beaten in the finals are better, no debate, than John Stockton and Carl Malone. There's no question about it. So... The Lakers need him tonight. There's no there, and they need him for these last five games to get some minutes. You know, obviously, if there's one positive to this ankle injury, it's that he's got fresh legs. He's had a month off, which is huge. And so if he comes back, can get, you know, get some minutes, get some playing time. Obviously, the chemistry in LA is fine. That there, that's fine. We saw that last year. They were off for four months. There was no basketball for four months. And they came back and clicked right along to the NBA title. So if, if LeBron can get fresh, get back into in the rhythm, here come the Lakers. Uh, and it is not a good day for me as, as a Warriors fan. We just lost to the Timberwolves last night. Goodness gracious. Anyways, that is all the time we have for today's show. Thank you guys so much for listening or watching live on Facebook Live, YouTube, and Twitter. If you listen to the podcast, you've listened on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcast, Anchor, as well as wherever you listen to your podcast. Uh, looking forward to the draft tonight. Looking forward to LeBron James coming back to the Lakers tonight. So um, a lot of sports this weekend. It's going to be a blast. Monday, I'll react to the totality of the draft. Will there be any, any Aaron Rodgers news 
in the next 72 hours. We'll have to you know, wait and see and find out if there are them. My goodness, we're set for a great show on Monday. Even if there isn't, we're set for a great show on Monday. So hope everybody has a great weekend. Please continue to stay safe. Happy birthday, Mom. God bless you all.